It might be international week but there's still plenty going on as Celtic gets set for a return to Premiership action at the weekend and it'll be followed closely by match day one of this season's Champions League. This is the Celtic Exchange Weekly, this is Tino and this week I'm joined by Miff and James as we cover all things Celtic. Miff, word is you've been on an eight day gloating spree since Ibrox, is this true? Hello Tino, hello James, hello listeners. Um, I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't say as far as gloating but definitely... Uh, Surprisingly happy. I wasn't expecting to be so happy, and just reflecting back and think that my own personal doom and gloom, never mind everybody else's, how I felt when I saw the team, and then how things subsequently transpired. I feeling a wee bit perky. Perky, mm. indeed. Good to hear. Perky. Uh, James, what about yourself? You've been reveling, or have you calmed down since last week? Uh, no, no, not calmed down. Um, I think it's just. It's a dawning realisation is, is the big thing over there. They know, they're starting to really get the message that this is it, you know. There's such a chasm between the clubs and they thought they were going to catch us cold with injuries and, you know, no fans and all that stuff. It didn't happen. Um, you see the clamour, there's a real meltdown. Um, you know, wanting to be allowed and everything's bad and it is, it's very enjoyable. Lots of rumours that, that Bill might be off the chop. That would be a disaster for us, Miff. That was, uh, that's not the news we're looking for. Well, it, 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 potentially it could be, but whoever comes in will still have Dessers, Lammers, mm. you know. All I, contracted I, up. I, I doubt, unless they're magicians, I, I, I don't really quite see how you're necessarily going to improve on that. The, the bizarre thing would be to sack him after five games, qualifiers, with his squad and know that you've got to January and you can't bring MD in, I think... You've no budget. You would, you would assume you let the manager do his best until then and if you get closer to the time. Or, albeit, yeah. albeit that they might think the gap's only four points. If we make a change just now, someone can come in and make that squad play better. Right. But I still think, like I mentioned last week, I think they're weaker. I, I think you're right. The, the logical thing from a football, you know, director of football board's point of view is right let, let's see it goes but see the reality is he's not got it everyone knows it so is it best just to cut it now not for us for them oh for them yes absolutely. everyone knows he's not got absolutely. it absolutely absolutely. I think so but we'll, we'll watch the space closely uh, what about the international stuff so Scotland doing pretty well now which is uh, fairly rare you know in terms of our lifetimes and stuff do you guys follow that he's, he's yes, into the international I watched, I watched most of the game they were cruising at 3-0 now Switched it off then, but that, that's not usually why you turn Scotland games off because they're they're going to squish it. Yeah, they turn it off because they're running three 0 or because they're losing three 0 Yeah. Um, if you take the young lads, have you been a couple of times? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah I'm a, 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 a I'm not. I, I wouldn't go that far. I've not got the desert timbies. Um, but I would say I've always been a big Scotland fan. Um, I think the first strip that I got was actually a Scotland strip there and a Celtic strip. So. Number eight on the back for Paul McStay of course. as well. Um, so, uh, yeah, and the, the boys are, are really into it as well. So I, I've really been enjoying it. And, and this campaign has just been absolutely fantastic. And I think the the characters in the Scotland squad are particularly enjoyable. Though, or yeah, a fairly stuff, decent, yeah. decent bunch, you know, the likes of John McGinn, Aaron Hickey, Kieran Tierney, uh, Scott McTominay I think I, I really rate Scott McTominay I find it bizarre that he's, he's kind of sidelined for, for Man United I, 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 I really see me tweeting about him McSauce yeah. love him absolutely love him. him love him I actually just driven by John McGinn on my way in here I said it to James so we record just near the Blythewood Hotel at the top of town and that's where the players stay pretty much so just scooted by John I could have chinned him to get in for a few words I'm, but a, bit, I'm a bit worried about the security risk here you know you've gave away where we record that so <laughs> could be, the, could be the, the women outside waiting for me the fans will be <laughs> down in their numbers ok let's take a look at what's coming up on this week's show with it being international week we decided to reach out to some listeners for some questions this week and that's given us a couple of really good topics to get stuck into first up we'll look at Celtic's new midfield options and how Brendan Rodgers might manage this area of the park as we navigate through another busy season then, as a follow-on from the big one at Ibrox, we assess whether the manager's message is now starting to land after some ups and downs in the first five competitive games back at the club. Then it's time once again for the 11th man, as the boys try and name the missing man from a well-known Celtic lineup. And finally, as we approach match day one of the Champions League, we'll bring you a focus on Feyenoord as we prepare to face the Dutch champions next Tuesday in Rotterdam. OK, let's get started with the first of two listeners' questions, which we'll be covering. And the first comes from Ryan McGinley. You'll catch Ryan on Twitter, at the Ryan McGinley. And he's been a big supporter of the show from an early stage. So thanks to Ryan for that. 
So his question is as follows, with a busy upcoming schedule of both domestic and European competition, do you think the midfield can be rotated effectively on a game-by-game -game basis? There'll be scope to do so with Hattai returning and the likes of home, Bernardo and Quan all vying for spaces. And in addition, this may allow us to keep Callum McGregor and Matt O'Reilly fresh for certain games. Myth note that Ryan doesn't even mention uh, David Turnbull or Awata, but that's up to him. What's your initial reply to that question? I think the answer to the question is yes, because I think it has to be yes. I, I don't see the point in having the amount of midfielders we have if we're not going to rotate them. Um, interesting, Awata is not mentioned there, because I, I still hold out hope of Awata being a I very so. effective player somewhere. for Celtic midfield. I don't, you know, if you think think of Quan coming in and being relatively untested, I wouldn't say Awata's performances in midfield have been such that you would be immediately dismissing them. I think there's enough there in Awata to play. Like, I, I look back at the 3-2 game at home, when we were struggling, Awata came on and changed the game by constantly making angles for passes when, when Rangers were really trying to press us. And I think in those games, I think to Europe, when you are going to be under a wee bit more pressure and you're maybe going to play a tf, tf, double pivot. So I think somebody like Awata would be the would be the man for the job for that. But, you know, I suppose it's a positive you don't mention Awata and Turnbull because it's just another addition in the embarrassment of riches that we have in there. It's still not known how effective Quan and Bernardo will be because we've not seen them. But the assumption is that they'll both be first team ready soon enough. Um, but I think we what we can't do is we, we can't just solely rely on McGregor, Hattati and O'Reilly. We, we have to have a wee bit more depth than that. James, it's an area that's clearly been highlighted for strengthening the fact they've gone out and signed three midfielders during the break. So yep, Thiago Holm, Quan, Bernardo who remains a, an unknown quantity and we'll, we'll see what comes of that. But do you think that's a move from Rodgers who's maybe said, listen, I need I need support here? And also, do you think it's a move that might have been made with a view to maybe losing a Hattati or O'Reilly? <laughs> Firstly, it's a great question uh, from Ryan because it is, there's so much content in there because there's so many players to discuss. I don't think we see Hattati going anytime soon. Um, there maybe was a thinking that a Turnbull was going to drop off. I'm with Miff, I think a Wata can, can do a job at, at some point. Funny enough, I, I was thinking about this very situation when, listen to yourself and Anthony Joseph, the um, Bernardo section, where we weren't really looking for someone in that position, but any good company, good club, is always looking to recruit if, if a solution, if a bit of talent comes up. And he, he came up available and he went, well, we've been, we've been scouting him, let's just get him in. So it was like, okay, that's fine. But then where does he play if you're doof, doof, double pivot? Then that's more for Europe. So I think you're going to see like Holman McGregor in Europe or McGregor and someone in your double six. And then ahead, you're going to probably have it mostly O'Reilly at the moment anyway. But then at the weekend, is it more Bernardo and O'Reilly and McGregor in the six? I think that's where you start to see it. Your, your twos become defensive in Europe and attacking in domestic. I also think uh, the Matt O'Reilly version two that we're, we're seeing is is very much like the original Matt O'Reilly version one that they enjoyed. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I know we, we have we have debated this uh, previously in the podcast around the positional change that Matt O'Reilly went through in McGregor's absence and then his subsequent I say struggles, but you know it wasn't a complete drop off in form, but just maybe even a wee lack of confidence in the attacking side of the game. He seems to have come back in the summer completely refreshed around that and. As much as it was bitterly disappointing to draw against St Johnson on another day, Matt O'Reilly could have had a hat trick. Um, they should have, aye. you know, so, somebody of yeah. his quality. Yeah. So I think we're seeing almost a, a refreshed Matt O'Reilly now. Um, I had actually spoken to someone in in the summer who's normally a fairly good provider of, of information, who had said to me, and I might, I think I mentioned it in the podcast that Starfield and O'Reilly were the two that were earmarked for moving on in, uh, really, in, in the summer. Really, and and given that the bid came in, albeit for Leeds, I, I don't. I think even O'Reilly himself would say, given where Leeds are at at the moment, that wouldn't necessarily have been a, a good move for him at this stage, given he's got to play in the Champions League with Celtic to move to the Championship. But that said, there's clearly interest in him from down south. Um, but I'd had it in good authority that that was, that was the two moves that were going to get made in terms of significant outgoings. Then possibly what's changed that is Jota leaving and the money that's come in for him. And also, I, I just think, with a change in manager as well, I think reading between the lines and some of the things that O'Reilly has said and his demeanour, 
he seems to be reinvigorated mm. under Rogers. Now, I, I may be putting two and two together and getting five, but I think the circumstances around O'Reilly appear to have changed. And I think we're going to benefit hugely from that because a refreshed, reinvigorated Matt O'Reilly playing in the Champions League, having had the experience that he's had, eh, I think is an exciting one. I think you can see, even in the, the post-goal celebrations at Ibrox, he was playing a real leading part and yeah. bringing the players together. And, and I just I just I can see that uh, maybe an added element of maturity around Matt O'Reilly as a character and also in his play. Yeah, I think he's he's one of a few guys that really stepped up when you need him at Ibrox, Joe Hart, Callum McGregor, O'Reilly and of course Kyogo uh, leading the line. And I think my right, James, he's, he's he's I think he's I was gonna say he found a new maturity. He's still only twenty two, something like oh, that. Very handsome. Yeah. Um and handsome. There, there's handsome. there's maybe no ceiling as to where he can go. You know, he's a smart guy, an ambitious guy, but clearly a quite a driven guy as well. Um and he'll move on to Celtic. It absolutely shouldn't be to somewhere like Leeds. And how can you go from lining up Champions League one week to then thinking, ah, maybe I'll go and play Stoke, you know, at another club. That's not in his thinking, I'm sure. But on you go. Playing against Haxers. Haxers, uh-huh. aye. I'd fancy. But he's definitely, at the moment, until we see more of Bernardo, more of Thiago Home, our strongest three, absolutely, at this moment in time, has to be O'Reilly, Callum McGregor and Rio Hattati. Absolutely. And I think Rio's back in training this week, so, you know, the quicker he's back, the better playing. So, look forward to that. But yeah, I would say that that's, that's your three for sure. On O'Reilly himself, he doesn't strike me as, you know, look at a Haxers and, you know, I want this and I want that. And I'm, other, going, I'm just going with Haxers now. Aye. Um, and get, have. and other, other guys like who are just clearly, you know, and sometimes, most times, it's agent driven, but they're happy to follow the money. That, that doesn't strike me as O'Reilly's profile at all. He's ambitious, sure, but he wants to develop his talent, his football, and play for teams that match his ambition. When we lose him, it won't be for mad money to, you know, a promoted Leeds or anything like that. It'll be for a, a calibre club, probably in Europe. A, a very quick segue that just came into my head there as well. Speaking of guys who left Celtic for lesser lights, your former hero myth, Gary Hooper, he's back in the headlines because he scored a couple of goals at the fives on <laughs> some, Saturday night. Some guys, over the break. some guys are going, he's not got a club. I mean, th- that would be mad. Great player for Celtic at the time. But actually, some guys, <laughs> some guys, <laughs> this guy. I was a wee bit annoyed at the revision. I was like, listen, Gary Hooper came, done a great job and he moved on for a few quid, five, six million maybe. But he decided to leave Celtic, you know, when his stock was high and you, you wouldn't even entertain the thought of him potentially coming back, would you? Yes, um, but he made, <laughs> um, he made the, ro- the wrong move at the wrong time. Uh, he just went to the wrong club. He was so desperate to get back down to England to score goals to try and get into the, he he the England the side. National, yeah. The problem is he played for a team that played defensively with one up front. Gary Hooper, no, he's thrived a in a partnership yeah, yeah. with Anthony Stokes that's the type of football that he, he needs to play he just made the wrong choice and, and subsequently his career suffered as a result of that but but make no bones about it he, he was top quality did yeah you, he was did you watch any of the Masters? no I didn't but I'd, I've seen a few clips of the carpet getting pulled up which <laughs> I right. thought was class yeah was, wasn't was great class. anyway fair play to Gary Hooper the boys Celtic went on to win it all good but fives is fives and, and real football is real football come back to the question uh, anti-Celtic's midfield we've mentioned him a couple of times in passing there but Odin Thiago home James your impressions so far he's been involved in every game apart from that St Johnson game uh, he got his first start against Kilmarnock and obviously we lost that one so not a, you know, a great impression but overall he's had an impact least of all uh, when he came on at Ibrox actually yeah I, I think he's a real talent um, he is the one that's leading the charge to take that that second slot, the defensive slot, if we're playing that role. But then he's he's more than just that. You know, he can, he can fill in. There's a real flexibility in the midfield, you know, home and beyond. But yeah, it's the way he carries himself. It's the way he strikes the ball, the way he receives the ball. You know, you can just see there's, there's, there's real talent there. I think he's going to be massive for Celtic in years to come. Yeah, he's off at the moment playing for Norway under 21s. I've played against San Marino. I think they won 7-1 on Thursday, something like that. And he'll play against Latvia tomorrow, Tuesday. So he's obviously in a good place there. And I think he's just at that stage of his career where he's really starting to show what he can do. Yeah, I think even a, a small snapshot of his self-belief is the fact he stepped off the bench, went on amazing, had an effort on target yeah. at, at Ibrox. And I know... You're just looking at that condensed and thinking yeah, he's obviously stepped onto the park and thought, right, you know, I'm, I'm not going to take the easy option here. I'm, I'm, I'm he was, going to try and make a difference. But he was looking for a pass. He was he he'd done his amazing. He was like, you know, show for me. Nobody showed him. In. I'll take my shot then. Mm-hmm. So it wasn't like he was just being greedy and you know snatching at stuff. And he, he's also got his eternal gift moment and his 
last second <laughs> of the game tackle and, and Cantwell it was just <laughs> phenomenal Cantwell went both feet up <laughs> didn't you go right didn't you go fantastic you, you've got to admire a guy that comes on at Ibrox in a high pressure situation and doesn't say I'm just going to play safe here mm-hmm. he's in a position in the midfield where he could just get it play it get it play it play it safe back to my centre half back to my goalie back to my right back but he's actually shown the character to say mm-hmm. I might not get that many opportunities here there's new guys coming in Bernardo's now breathing down my neck and others I'm going to show the guys that I've got something and maybe next time at Ibrox I should be starting and he's got a bit of something as a character he's a wee bit I'm not mad on the the Instagram stuff but you know he put a couple of wee things up and he's definitely got something about him as a character yeah self-belief you know he's, he's I mean I managed to decides to give himself a, a Tiago not nickname deed pole name he carries a bit of self-belief that he's going to go somewhere you know I might add Tiago in the morning man. <laughs> just drop in head down to the office tomorrow yeah. morning yeah, good. throw it in there see how it goes um, but yeah he's got belief in himself hasn't he yeah but you know if you look at all the most successful um, not even footballers sports people actors business people whatever they have that unshakable self-belief um, sometimes it's unjustified but it seems to be justified with him. Well, there's a fine line, isn't there? And that's what he's got to be careful of. So, so far, so good, Muff. You know, I like how he's approached things. He's a young man coming to a new country. But he'll need to continue to back things up in the park. It's all well and good, you know, putting the social media posts out. But he'll need to continue to impress. And if he gets another start, likes of the Kamarnock game, he'll need to show that, okay, you know, that was all part of my development. But I can now step in and be part of a, a winning Celtic side. Well, I think, in fairness, that's something that's always been fairly well managed internally by Celtic, whether that's you know, ways on people at the club or even the senior pros in the, in the dressing room, there, there very rarely appears to be too much that that, that steps out of line. Um, more recent examples where it's been maybe Jakimakis or Haksabanovic, they they get they get moved on. You know, it's obviously a tight group where they're trying to give out a, a unified front, a unified message. And I, I think as long as that, that's been managed in the dressing room or, or by people close to the club, then... You know, guys at home that come in and they've got the youthful exuberance and enthusiasm. Great, you don't want to temper that. But ultimately, do your talking in the park. Mm-hmm. Yeah, exactly. A um, couple of guys that we've just not seen enough of or any of in terms of Bernardo. So Bernardo and Quan, they may well, may, well, may well go on to have an impact. Excuse me. Um, Bernardo's been away, James, with Portugal's under 21, so he's clearly rated there. Quan, I don't know. I'd like to think he's up at Lennox Town putting some work in. Uh, but we'll need to reserve judgment on those two for now. Um, another guy, though, who's absolutely vital to everything Celtic do is Rio Hattati and as you've mentioned he's due back after the international break uh, how important could he be particularly heading into Champions League stuff? Massive I mean if you take you know peak last season Rio you probably don't lose to Kamarnock you probably don't draw against St Johnson you know it's a, a big big factor in those results um, and again it was like listening to Andy Joseph's take on the relationship with Rogers and Hattati and you know how there was going to have to be a bit of adjustment to, to the new style and stuff and it was, wasn't there was no snubbing on the contract it was just a matter of right we'll get the finances right and that'll probably be sorted but it wasn't like there was a clash between Roger's style and Hattati's attitude or anything like that you know so we've got the chance now to bring him back in it's, it's going to be really interesting because I do want to see obviously Bernardo I want to see home but I don't want to see any of my <laughs> the Rio Hattati Matt O'Reilly and Cal McGregor yeah Muff before I come to you for your take on Rio James has mentioned twice now the Anthony Joseph interview and it'd be remiss of me not to, to emphasise that here so spoke to Anthony last week he's a good friend of the show and he was on doing the, the summer transfer special so given the various insights and inside stories on the, the comings and goings at Celtic over the summer so to access that and all our other additional content you can do so at the Celtic Exchange Plus just visit the CelticExchange.com slash plus. Muff, Rio Hattati, you're a huge fan. What are you saying? Oh, that was beautifully done, wasn't it? That's <laughs> just so professional. Wasn't even, wasn't even planned. So professional. <laughs> uh, well, I think everybody knows how I feel about Rio Hattati. I absolutely love him. Um, if you're naming your strongest Celtic 11 out the available squad, he's in it. I think whilst Turnbull has done well in some aspects, he's not done too well in others. I think when you seen that maybe getting into the hour mark at Ibrox he seemed to be really struggling just with his mobility that's something that's been levelled at Hattati before uh, but I, I think it's something that he really improved on uh, last season so for me Hattati's got to start in as many games as, as possible because he's just an absolute maverick he's, he's class He's only played 48 competitive minutes so far this season obviously curtailed by injury but he didn't get the nod and I wonder if that was just a bit of Brendan Rodgers' man management, you know, I, I think he clearly 
has watched what he's done for Celtic in the last couple of years. He'll have worked closely with him in his first few weeks of pre-season. And I think he himself, he will know that Rio Hattati is part of Celtic's best 11 at this moment in time. Well, if, if he does any sort of post-match analysis, he'll see the impact that Hattati had in both games. He, he made a significant impact in both. Yeah. What about David Turnbull uh, and Iwata? So obviously, as, as mentioned at the top of the piece, Ryan hasn't even mentioned them, which, which is... It's not a slight on Ryan, it's just it's probably symptomatic of where a lot of the fans are. They've maybe just given up on Iwata and to an extent on Turnbull. And I'm so disappointed by Turnbull because we speak about Turnbull often enough here. He got his chance, he's had three starts, including one at Ibrooks, and it's not quite happened, James. And I think you, you would expect now that as soon as Rio Hattati is back fit, he'll be in. And if it's not Rio Hattati, it might be Thiago Holm or it might even be Bernardo. So David Turnbull had a chance, he was top of the queue and he might just have fallen right back down again. I think he 100% had, he's been given his shot. Um, you know, we said last year that it was Angie's football that didn't suit Turnbull, it was too pacey, dynamic, fast. You know, He's a, an intelligent footballer, a talented footballer but likes more time on the ball. Rogers football is a lot more patient build up, it's a lot more intricate passing and you know, ball retention and things like that. That should be tailor made for Turnbull and he's not... Like I think I said it last week, he was he was hiding for me at Ibrooks, and that is fine on on the coffin. You just cannot do it. I, uh, I don't like pitching that at players. I don't think he's a coward. I think he's a brave enough player and he's happy to take the ball. But maybe with if his confidence is low, he maybe shows less naturally, that kind of thing. I don't think he's a kind of guy that hides, but I, I totally agree his performances haven't been there. So I, I'd said to Paddy on the chat a couple of weeks ago, <laughs> he never struck me as a hider, but he also wasn't a seeker. You know, he wasn't going looking for it. He wasn't hiding away from it, but he wasn't then pursuing to, to change the game. <laughs> Hold on, this is how we judge players now. He's not a hider, he's not a seeker, but he's somewhere in between. You've got to be a seeker. All players have got to be seekers. Show for the ball, you know, be hungry. But I genuinely, I genuinely think he crossed that line and they hiding a wee bit at Ibrox on, on Sunday last week. Maff, when you were a baller, were I you a hider or a seeker? Never a uh, hider. No, I was, you know that. No, I, was <laughs> um, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't go that far. I don't, I don't think it was hiding. I don't I, I, I would say Turnbull Turnbull is someone who is constantly looking to go into the ball I think his game has just become very safe and what, it, it, what sorry, made, sorry to cut you off it's just to the point I made about Thiago Holm though isn't it Thiago Holm could have come on and, and been safe but, but, but he's done the opposite. It, it, it appeared dynamic and the difference is you know quite often in games when we're playing against the low block I'm coming up with another mm. day Double pivot Low block It'll be high press next guys Stay tuned um, Carrying the ball Quickly for 5 to 10 yards Can make all the difference yep. Pulling players out of position Finding that wee gap Or creating a gap for someone else With, with Turnbull I think it would be fair to say That he, he did kind of have that about him When he first broke into the, the first team He, he, he was a game was a changer light. Yeah, 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 yeah. He, he was dynamic and for whatever reason, he has had subsequent follow-up injuries. You know, I think he's had troubles with his hamstrings a couple of times um, since he's, he's kind of come back into the team. But by by not doing that and then others coming into the team and doing that, it it's just showing up the bit that he's lacking. Now, whether David Turnbull at his age will be happy to be, you know, playing the last 15 minutes when we're already 2-0 up to retain the ball, I, he doesn't strike me as that kind of guy. I think he... You could see frustration last year and I th think to some degree, you know, a bit of relief after the Ross County performance for him. But when you're at a club at Celtic, it's all about that level of consistency over a long season and being able to do things that pull results out of the bag from maybe not impossible positions, but when you're looking like to drop points so far. And same goes for the entire squad, really. There's been a fairly meek draw and a League Cup exit in there. So it's natural that you turn your focus on right who's been playing in those games, what have they given us, or what have they not given us, more, more to the point. And I think I, I think rather than purely focus on just how bad Turnbull's been, for want of a better expression, there is probably quite a crude expression, but I think it, it really does boil down to how much we've missed a player of Rio Hattati's standard and ability it's very very significant especially for our squad as for Turnbull I, I, still early days in, in the season there's many more battles to come but with who we've brought in 
and in the positions we've brought them in, it is so fierce for competition in that midfield. And if somebody like Home has come in, done well, we're all keen to see Bernardo. We still think there's a chance for for Quan. Um, he'll still be acclimatising. And then Awat is there, who I, I don't think is a right off by any means. That's that's some pretty fierce competition. Awat has been getting judged because he's not a centre half or a right back, and it's like that's not what he's assigned for, you know. No. We've not seen enough of him in, in, in centre and mid to be able to judge him, and I I think we need to see that. I agree, but I wonder if there's maybe a reason why we're just not seeing minutes of him. You know, if Rogers has seen something or not in training to say mm, there's other guys ahead of him in the queue. He's the physicality that Rogers is crying out for. I, I'd love to see it. I, you and I get quite excited watching his cameos during the second half of last season. He just came on and, and showed that he had something. That's not disappeared overnight. So let's see. And I think he's still currently the J League's Player of the Year. You know, he won it. You know, the season before he came to us. So, um, just on David Turnbull, it's funny, isn't it? We think of him as a relatively new Celtic player, yet all of a sudden I think he's now in his fourth season. And actually, he, he and Joe Hart are in the final yeah, uh, year can, of their contract. Sign in January. And the way it's looking just now, despite, you know, a, a promise and an optimistic start to the season at Ross County, you kind of can't see it going any other way, James, and I'm just running down the clock and, and moving on. Is that is that knee-jerk? Because listen, I love getting as excited as anybody at the start of the season. I, I, I thought the Ross County stuff's, right, this is time, this is time to kick on. Mm. And a few few weeks later, I find myself changing my tune quite dramatically. It's not knee-jerk, you're just, you're just a bit disappointed in him, I suppose. Um, he should have gone in the transfer window for me, 100%. Um, both in terms of what he's contributing to the team and contract management from Michael Nicholson, Mark Law and co. This is sloppy. From Celtic to let a guy run in his last six months come January. I think he's winched a bird. You've been after it, Ranson. <laughs> it's only can come. It's, it's, it's quite it's quite bitter, isn't oh, it? Oh, it's targeted. Yeah. <laughs> to, to, to tell me any of that that doesn't ring true. Um, what do you get if you sell them in the summer? What here? Uh, what have you just sold them? What would you got? Couple of million. No, who, who's giving you that? I think you'd get that for. I think you. I really think I, you would. I don't think so at the moment. I think Celtic. It, Rogers has played this whole thing about. I needed time to come in and assess the squad. He's come in and had a look at Turnbull and thought maybe I can do something. Now he, he done it with James Forrest. I think. I think James Forrest was in the last uh, year of his contract, and there was talk about him going to Spurs and different things. And Rogers came in and brought him to life. And I think Rogers will see that as a challenge to bring guys like David Turnbull back into the fold. Can he do something with Greg Taylor? Can he work miracles with um, Burnaby? It just seems all at sea. Things like that. But we'll move on from Turnbull just now. But he's a constant topic for, for good reason because he's got talent and I think we all want to see guys like that succeed, but it's not it's not quite happened. Um, we've obviously got the, the first game against Feyenoord coming up and we'll review that in a bit more detail later on the show, but that'll be very telling as to what Brendan Rodgers thinks is his strongest suit in Europe away from home. So I think we all agree that it's McGregor, O'Reilly, Hattati, the three best guys, but... Are they the three Not best to fit game. in for that game? No. You enjoying this Come back idea? to me. Come back to me. So what do you think? Come back to me. No, because I, I don't think away in Europe we're going to play um, two attacking midfielders. You know, you're going to have your double pivot there. But, there you are. But as a double pivot, O'Reilly, who's shown he can do it in McGregor's absence alongside? No, I, th I think it's, I, despite the versatility <laughs> that Matt O'Reilly brings to the team, I, I hate to see him in that position because it's a real waste of his talent further up plus the, the alternative is he's on the bench then instead of a no I would have a really ahead of a tatty at the moment because he's phenomenal at chasing uh, chasing things down and breaking things up so you're getting extra defensive work there that you don't necessarily get from Rio you know I, I, it would be for me McGregor probably home at the moment it's maybe a wee bit premature but probably home and O'Reilly so McGregor and home sitting mm -hmm. With O'Reilly giving you a bit more support because he done it so well at Ibrox, didn't he? he showed that yeah, tracking yeah. back and that defensive. But, but also the the, the flair side of things that we'll, we'll need to break forward. If you agree with that three, oh, I don't know. Uh, I would. Oh, Do you want some more time? I, think? I would. No, 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 no. I'll, I'll take it on. Um, but besides that, a water would be the one for me, genuinely. And if I, I, we'd seen more of I, him, I, I, I think he's the logical solution to sort in with McGregor. Sinky mm. pitched a water for a start at Ibrox. Same same rationale. We yeah. haven't seen enough of him, but we think that he could potentially do that job. But I suppose it's a gamble, isn't it? I I, I would lean towards a water if I'd seen more of him. I, but, <clears throat> but like you say, and and this is a great point that we often miss as fans. We're not seeing it every day. Mm -hmm. We're not seeing what goes on every day now. In the context of Tomoki Awata, all the chat was just about how impressive 
a character he was and how good a guy he was. You know, always in the gym, always looking to make himself better. Always, so I, you know that that to me is the type of thing that Rogers just loves. He's then played him at right back in pre season. Yeah, unfair to be judged on that. Yeah, because we didn't have any right backs. Uh, you know, so unfair to judge him on that. I just don't think he's had the chance yet to prove himself in, in central midfield for Rogers. I'm referencing what I've seen last season mm -hmm. when he played and I, and I quite liked it. It, was, it never at any point was I think this guy's useless, he shouldn't be kicking a ball for Celtic. I don't think there's anybody out there that, that thinks that. But I think people's opinion of him has been clouded by the fact that he moved back into centre half and maybe didn't he cover himself in glory. I, th I think that's I think that's a tad unfair it's but, very, very but unfair. ultimately only one man's opinion matters and currently he doesn't it, see fit and it's yours isn't it well, <laughs> well don't you know, don't massage my ego anymore you know <laughs> but so if you hold on if I you're, find it interesting if you're picking the team for fire there's a what on it <laughs> yes <laughs> yes yes yeah. right. with, with McGregor and who's up ahead of them Tati or O'Reilly or if Bernardo. If, if, oh. No, Bernardo's he's no No ready yet. Nah, he's no he's no in, under consideration. Ironic given I've said that what is, but I'm talking oh, about Turnbull, specifically for that. Role. No, 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 no. It would be either a Riley and Hattati, but if Hattati's not played before that it would need to be a Riley. But then if Hawat has not played and I'm bringing him in, so <laughs> in this hypothetical argument it would I would it's still, not hypothetical, it's happening. You've tied I, yourself in knots here. Well well, look at it this way. You don't want to lose a Riley back to that defensive position when he's played so well going forward. So you would probably want to use him exclusively in that sort of 10 attacking mm -hmm. midfield role. But real attack is real attack. And I just think he trumps everybody, albeit that I've, I've absolutely loved this season's version of Matt Riley. So yeah, I want a McGregor Hattati for me. It's an easy of Interesting. force that. I, I'm, I'm somewhere on a similar page in terms of Hattati. I just think if you've got... I, I think he's got Mercurial. that star quality. Yeah, yeah. And I think he's the guy that maybe become Celtic's next biggest export but I think uh, the fitness will come into it but I hope it's Dundee on Saturday and it'll be telling whether he starts or comes off the bench or what happens there but I think O'Reilly's been the standout this season so far yeah. overall he's, yeah. he's shown some real maturity some real quality and he's going to continue to get better so I think it is McGregor I think, think O'Reilly I think Postecoglou picks a tie I think Rogers picks O'Reilly mm, time will tell more pragmatic. the interesting thing about it is we're just over a week away from that game against Feyenoord and it's intriguing it's an away fixture as well so you know this is where we'll really see what Rogers intends to do in Europe. How pragmatic is he going to be? We took absolute tankings in the Bern uh, the new camp and over at the uh, against PSG, oh, PSG yeah. and we just don't want to see that again. So let's see how he sets up uh, against Feyenoord. Yeah, go. He mentioned his name. I was fine. I was in a good mood, but he mentioned his name. He P. And I'm getting emotional. <laughs> <laughs> um, just He's as we as we move on from the question. So you're right, James. You know Ryan's. It's a Fairly short question, but it's got uh, it's arms and legs. It's a good one to yeah, debate. Yeah. Um, in terms of, you know, rotation and how often you like to see those changes, you certainly want the big guns, you know, the O'Reilly's, the Hattati's, the McGregor's um, for the, the Rangers games, the big European games. So what do you do? Do you, do you rest them, inverted commas, and bring in the other guys when you're playing, say, a Dundee at home on Saturday? I think there'll be a time and a place for that. I don't think it's now because we haven't got momentum yet. Um, I think we need to go out strong uh, the weekend um, with, yeah, you're pretty much your full strength team. Take that then into the game on Tuesday. And then once you start to get that momentum going and, you know, tiredness or fresh, you know, resting guys to, to keep them fresh, that starts to play its, its part maybe after the third Champions League game, that, that kind of thing, not just now. Yeah, if it is a long old season, but any kind of final take on this one before we move on in terms of the, the rotation? Well, you, you talk about Dundee at home, but we never beat St. Johnson at home. Like James says, we just need to take care yeah. of business first and foremost, play your strongest team or what you perceive to be your strongest team and, and then take it from there. It will be interesting though, around the whole midfield structure and Hattati's availability and, and whether or not he plays. For me, it's just so critically important we get him up to speed and match ready because he is he, he is the key for me probably off the bench I would say 
Yeah, I'd agree though it's important to get him fully back up to speed because his season's not quite got started at all has it so let's see but Celtic we've definitely got options we've brought in those three three new midfielders there was already a bundle of guys sitting good to go we've not mentioned James McCarthy we can't yeah. really cover that uh, but good question from Ryan thanks again for the support and thanks for sending that one in uh, the next question it comes from Keith McLachlan Keith is Grip House Keith on Twitter fancy I got that myth the old MMA stuff oh dear no. <laughs> no, not for no, you. No, no, no. Um, but again, Keith's a, a big supporter of the show, so thanks to him for sending this in. Uh, he says, at Ibrox, did we see the start of a team understanding how the manager wants them to play? Um, James, as mentioned, the Rangers game is just their fifth competitive game since the Rodgers return. Some ups and downs definitely in the first four, but much more signs for encouragement from this one. Yeah, particularly the first half. Um, it was interesting. You could see Rodgers' influence on both halves for, for different reasons. First half, play with freedom. A lot of, you know, really... Beautiful moves coming together, beautiful passing manoeuvres. Everyone knew where the other guy was, where they needed to be. There was real cohesion there, so I'd say first half certainly. Second half was just a really well managed game, not as fluid, not as you know looking to attack as much, take your chances when they come kind of stuff, but really, really well managed by Rogers. So uh, to answer the question, I suppose you saw it more in the first half than the second half, but the second half you saw the team spirit and the ability to follow instruction. What's almost been forgotten, Muff, because um, obviously you know, all the talks about Kyogo's goal and what an amazing finish it was, the the moves that didn't quite come off, you know, the, the couple of chances Kyogo had in the first half, one of the through balls from Callum McGregor was exceptional. It, and it, it deserved a goal. It's one that would be played back for years and years if it finished in a goal. And people are forgetting just how well Celtic linked up, as James says at times, in that first half. Well, they were fantastic. And given Keith's a good fighter, I'm just going to agree with him. <laughs> um, Bill said, mate, eh, I thought the first half, the, the control we had in the game, I, I think I mentioned that last week, look back in any recent performance at Ibrox, in terms of control of the ball, it's that's the best we've had in a long, long time. A long time. And second half, you're naturally going to come under pressure. The game does change. But just be a wee bit more care. The game's done. The game's done in the first 10 minutes of the second half. So, probably only allowed ourselves to blame for that. But, yeah, I think I think you can clearly see Rogers Hallmark coming. I think what excites me is I truly believe this time as a squad he's probably got more good players to choose from. It's just because of injuries and also a wee bit of loss of form for, for some players. It's maybe not in quite at the levels that we'd hoped for. But the most pleasing thing for me was as again we mentioned last week, was the stepping up of the, the senior players in the team and, you know, really playing for the manager. Which, given given the given the the impression that the previous manager left was that that's one area that he really had covered off was that everybody's jobs were pretty clear and there was a senior presence in the dressing room that were in control of the dressing room. With Rogers coming back in, he obviously manages in a lot more personable way than than Ange did, and then as a result. How would that disrupt the dress, or potentially disrupt the dressing room, or would that would it just be harmonious and everybody would, would keep on keep on the same page as a manager? I think what we're seeing now is difference in the style and the play, but what doesn't change is Callum McGregor being that focal point. He had a bit of a quiet start to the season. I think everybody was in, in, in agreement with that. But for a man that plays so much football and is so pivotal to club and country, as we're seeing now, at that really really big moment when we needed him the most, he didn't have to turn up. Mm -hmm. I think that's the most important thing James just in terms of we heard guys like Joe Hart and I think Cal McGregor himself speaking in recent weeks you know in the early weeks of the season saying that they were fully you know quote unquote on board with the manager's message it's all well saying that you need to then show it and I think as Math mentions Cal McGregor absolutely stood up when, when he was needed uh, Joe Hart done the same uh, Matt O'Reilly we've mentioned in Kyogo big big important players step up on the big occasion and those four guys as much as anyone drove the team on the day and I think that, that just shows that Rodgers has got the the confidence these players now and they believe in what he's trying to do yeah and and very probably he always did um, just sometimes it takes time you know it's uh, Rodgers is a real student of the game you know and he's studied football his, his, his whole career he's taken all of those years of knowledge and experience and then trying to deliver that to guys and say, right, you need to get it today. You know, there was probably some early season panic, like that click. Uh, probably some early season panic, maybe for myself included, you know. Um, but it, that was the perfect opportunity to show not only that you've bought in 
but you know how to deliver it. And those passing moves on, on Sunday last week showed, showed us that they definitely can. And that you've got the senior pros fully ready to deliver like Joe Hart, like Cal McGregor. Can I just, are you calm now? Very calm. Are you? Very calm. Are, you are you happy uh, solely based on oh, I thought performance? You meant within myself, you mean Celtic wise? Uh, just based on performance and result at Ibrox, that, that's been enough for you to go, nah, everyone's fine. No, 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 no absolutely not. You know, there's, there's, that's what I'm saying about momentum. You know, they really need to hit it at the weekend and they need to do something in final to show us what? that, you know, we're starting to deliver it on the yep. pitch. No, no, it, it, one swallow doesn't a summer make, but it's a start. Oh, it's, an old, it's an old classic. I started last week's show, though, as, as you'll remember, talking about it's amazing the difference that one 90 minutes can make to the whole mood in the camp. And I stand by that. And, you know, we can all fall foul of it because, you know, after the, the draw at St. John's and the loss at Kilmarnock, there was people, you know, friends of mine and stuff and, and folk in group chats, I'm sure you've seen as well, uh, something all right with Rogers, you know, why is he even coming back? What's the motivation for Rogers? All these kind of kind of questions. And these are the questions that always get levelled at you. After, not even just after a defeat, after a draw at Celtic. That's just the way of the world up here. Um, you're a hero one week, a villain the next, all these kind of things. But what I thought was most pleasing about the win at Ibrox, or a lot of pleasing things about the win, <laughs> but one of the most pleasing things was that you could see that Rogers had the bit between his teeth. You'll have seen the picture of him pulling out of Celtic Park <laughs> in the Range Rover with the shades <laughs> on. <laughs> hand in the <laughs> sky absolutely loving life there's a quote from him which I thought was really good though and this is before the win so this was maybe Thursday or Friday ahead of going to Ibrox and he said I know how to win and I know what it takes to win and I'll show the players over the course of the season and over the course of my time here I believe that we will do that and I think that just showed a real belief in himself you know because he, he'll have been he'll have felt the criticism you know he's not come back up here to take grief and get told you're a failure as a manager the guy is a student of the game as you say James he knows his stuff he's proven himself as a as a talented coach and I just thought he had the spark back at Ibrox he cut to him at the dugout at different times yeah. and I just thought it was a really really important 90 minutes for him as much as for the players yeah um, and we, you know we talk earlier on about self-belief of uh, home Rogers got it in spades you know mm. and it, he's Got the track record. I'd love to see him on Instagram. <laughs> did you Did you see the <laughs> uh, the Brendanometer? One extremely oh, right, exactly. background. To what now? It was B B R, and then turned to Brendan. <laughs> <laughs> and it was it was a way back. It was I think a way it was to Brendan. The Rat Rogers B R Brendan, ah, yeah. and, he, and he's now he's, filling, he's back, filling he's back the Brendan box. Just um, one one more drawn and it'll be shh. yeah. <laughs> and I don't think any of you lads are were against his his appointment were you? But obviously. It just took a bit of time, but these... <laughs> no. I'm, I'm sorry, I'll give you your moment then, Matt. Were you against his appointment? No. Am I not on record? No, I thought I, we did a podcast on it. I, I wasn't uh, here, remember? Where were you? I was away, you just covered it. I was, I um, no, I mean, I think when it came to the point, we went, right, here's here's the options. <laughs> I've said it before when, no harm, sorry, Davey, but when David Moyes' name came in at the fold, I was like, right, Rogers it is. It, it, it was the choice, but in another world... I would have maybe liked it not to be the choice, but once he was available, he was 100% the choice. I just wasn't happy at the time. I was very emotional. No, it's Celtic, why it's just life. Is he, is he, Brend just, is he just, Brendan yet it's for just you? No is he BR? Brendan? Mr. Rogers? What do you call him? <laughs> Proj. And interestingly, if you noticed how Mr. Beale would become Beale. Yeah, that's the narrative changed and then some. Uh, um, but no, as I was saying there, you know, the question, you know, back to it from Keith is, is it signs that the players are, are kind of getting on board? And yes, it definitely is, and we've covered that. But I think it's signs that, that Brendan Rodgers himself is finding his feet once again back here. I think regardless of the circumstances, given Ibrox was only four games in, Man, five Max games day in. four, yeah. And coming away with a win, you, ha you have to be on the same page. You can't go there as a broken team and come away with three points, no matter how bad or perceived how bad the Rangers are or have been. It, it just doesn't happen. So... I think the only answer you can come away with is yes, but given the previously shaky performances before that, Saturday's got to be really, really interesting just mm. to see how we come out and how we go about things. Yeah. What I'd like to ask, and I suppose this is you know to listeners or anyone that's watching on YouTube, there's quite a lot of folks, particularly after the, the Kamarnock and St. Johnson results, who are quite ready and willing to come in and sink the boot. I told you so, Rogers isn't the man, this isn't working and all this kind of stuff. And I can understand to a point, you know, those reactions. Can I understand them? Maybe. Um, I'd like to ask a question now. Where are people at? Is there anyone who still thinks Rogers isn't the man? 
shouldn't be at the club either for the way he left or just isn't the right fit for the job. Um, because there was people waiting for Celtic not to burn at Ibrox and they'd have been all over it. And this would have been a horrendous international week for us. As I say, 90 minutes or 190 minutes can make a hell of a difference in Celtic world. But I'd like to hear if anyone's got anything you know, to say at this, this moment in time about Rodgers being the man. So whether that's in the, the YouTube comments or on Twitter or whatever, let us know if that's how you still feel about it because it'd be interesting just to, to gauge where everyone finds himself. You know, would they have bagged Angie's first four games then? You know, can't win away. Yeah, but the, the, the point that was made, and I think it's a good point, that Rodgers, like at Olympic, came back with just a whole lot less goodwill. Andrew was this new guy we'd never heard of. He spoke well from day one. Yeah, so he got a bit of time. We've got history with Brendan Rodgers, yeah. and we know that he left in such a fashion. So naturally, he was coming back on a, you know, far less, um, with far less goodwill. So I just wonder where people are at on it at the moment. You know, it's professional football. You need to have a similar level of, a similar threshold of tolerance for bumps and scrapes you know you can't just be ready to hit the button because you didn't really like him and you, there's a wee bit of see I told you wasn't he you know you shouldn't have come back and all this kind of stuff it's like he's a manager now he's a talented guy very experienced guy you need to give him time we've given him a wee bit of time to the Rangers game obviously he's gone and done the business so nah I just don't buy it I think you've just got to be patient on these things football is also an emotional game we know that it's not all rational and, and clear heads is it and we've got an emotional guy right here that, that will tell you that sometimes people just get caught up in all of it well I, I took that quite personally when James was going on his yeah that was not directed at you I, I felt I felt, I felt personally attacked um, I, I'll never sit well with me ever what happened that Both why should why should it Rodgers or possibly or both? I just think the way things panned out, firstly, Rodgers leaving will never sit well with me. Um, and just leaving at all would never have sat well with me any time. You can't have them both. Um, no, I, I get that. However, the rational part of me says Rodgers was the best available at the time and probably the only logical appointment. That said... Um, the, the fact that we were used to a certain style of football under Ange and then coming back to Rodgers is potentially a tricky one because yeah. as, 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 as I, a, as I, a I'm not a big, uh, big fan of that. I'd rather we were still playing mad Ange ball. I mean, uh, the, aye, the football... I mean, don't get me wrong, there was games under Ange where it was, it was tedious, but that was mainly no the start. Many. It was mainly no the start. Mainly the start as he was getting his message across. Yeah. Ultimately, what, what's done is done. And the, the point I'm at personally is even though I'll still have a wee bitch and a moan about things... Celtic's my team and Rogers is my manager so I, I just need to get on the you know I'd, I've already had my wee sulk first few games of the season I wasn't happy and I'm kind of over it a bit and I think the international break came at a good time for me this came at a good time for Miff aye thank you um, so now that I've, I've done that and I've had a wee bit of time and obviously the result at Ibrox helps massively we just don't need to go on the same page. However, if, if we draw points against Dundee and then get pumped at fire, not then I'll, out. I'll, be, oh, I'll, be, I'll be back, man. <laughs> I do remember you saying you know, a few weeks back now that ultimately Celtic is your team and you'll support Celtic, whatever's going on. And if it happens to be that Brendan Rodgers is the man, then yeah, you can be unhappy about it, but you're on board as a fan. And, and I think that that's a fair assumption. Nobody needs to be delighted at the nature of how he left, but you need to look at the reality in the bigger picture. He's here now, so, so we need to get used to it. And the signs at Ibrox are that things are, you know, back in a, in a good way. Just the last thing, um, you obviously need to consider the the injury issues that he's had to contend with from day one. So we signed Marco Tillio, we've yet to see him, and that in itself could be quite exciting. We'll see what we get in the next few weeks. Uh, and there's no doubt that once Celtic get Real Hattati back, hopefully this weekend, and Carter Vickers, which I think sometime in October, Celtic are a much better, you know, proposition than what we've seen so far. Yeah. Carter Vickers and Hattati are, are two strongest performers for last year. Maybe McGregor and Kyogo alongside. But certainly, you know, two of the top two. So you take them out of any team and it's going to... Two of the top four, sorry. Take them out of any team and they're, they're going to have an impact. So, yeah. The, we, we spoke about this last week, the six players to come back in. So between guys we've signed and guys we know are absolute dynamite, that's when it really starts. Yeah, so I think generally speaking, we're in agreement in answer to Keith's question that Undoubtedly, we've seen the signs that Celtic are starting to take on board the message that Rodgers has given. But likewise, as mentioned, Rodgers himself seems to have kind of found his, his edge again, which is great to see. So that's only going to improve in the coming weeks. Thanks again to Keith to, uh, for the question. Thanks to Ryan and everyone else who's been engaging with us on Twitter. You'll find us there at Celt Exchange. Moving on, lads, it's time for the 11th man, where all you need to do is name the missing player from a well-known Celtic lineup. Uh, last week, you feel spectacularly. 
Um, but if you want to check your phones at the moment, so I've sent you the graphic earlier on. James was moaning, Muff, that he never had the graphic in front of him. It wasn't fair, he was saying. Um, so now you've I would got agree. that. Yeah. Uh, last week's answer for anyone oh, who missed it was Olivier and Jam. He was a missing man from the team that beat Rangers 3-2 at Ibrox back on 11th of March 2018. Yes, Muff, sir. before we get into this week's 11th man, your thoughts on Olivier and Jam? I, I, I liked him, but uh, very inconsistent. Very inconsistent and, and seemed seemed to be someone who who turned it on as as in when when he was good he was very good very classy player and I think I think the turning point for him may have been he I think he had a chance to go to Italy was it and we knocked we knocked Sport and Lisbon maybe yeah, yeah in fact I think that was it yeah, no Porto it was Porto, wasn't it? It was yeah. Porto. Um, he had the chance to go to Porto. We knocked it back, and I, and I think he sort of he, he kind of. I wouldn't necessarily say down tools, but his his enjoyment of playing for Celtic seemed to to suffer after that. But but definitely when he was good, it was very good. And any player that comes and and scores a winner against Rangers will always be really fondly remembered. Absolutely. Anyone watching on YouTube just now will see that James isn't even listening to him if he's fully focused on the graphic uh, for this week's 11th man. So the game in question, it's Celtic 1, Airdrie now. It's the Scottish Cup final from the 27th of May, 1995 at Hamden Park. Uh, I'll read out the lineup, and it is as follows. Pat Bonner, Rudy Vata, Tosh McKinley, Mark McNally, Tom Boyd, Peter Grant, Paul McStay, Blank, John Collins, Pierre Van Hoydonk and Simon Donnelly. Have a wee think while we play this next short message. Well, the guys are figuring that one out, a short reminder that if you like what we do here at the Celtic Exchange, then you can hear even more from us throughout the week by joining the Celtic Exchange Plus. At the Celtic Exchange Plus, we provide pre- and post-match podcasts for every Celtic game, as well as a number of other exclusive subscriber benefits. All you have to do is visit theCelticExchange.com slash plus right now for full details and to start your free trial. More podcasts, more reaction, more Celtic, all on the Celtic Exchange Plus. So plenty of time for conferring, James. You've got your B graphic in front of you. I've given you all the help I can. What's your answer? I'm going to defer to my learned colleague here. Am I going for my first year or uh, second? Second year. Second year. What's your first year? Andre Stone. Your second one is correct. Oh. Well done. <laughs> uh, did you get it, James? Would you have got it? I knew when Miff told me the answer. <laughs> <laughs> that is fine. So one out of two for you, lads. Feel your last week. Uh, can I done yourself no harm this week though oh. getting back on track? The graphic. One. One out of two <laughs> after your failure last week, some would just say it's one each. Aye, <laughs> some people would just say that. Aye, uh, you know, one each. There's yeah. certain ways you can spin things, it's one each. But what we'll do, what we'll do, as always, we'll post the lineup minus the 11th man across Twitter and Instagram on Tuesday morning. So if you want to have a guess, let us know there and we'll select some lucky winners to receive a bonus 14 day trial of the Celtic Exchange Plus. As we know, the Champions League draw has placed us in Group E alongside Feyenoord, Lazio, and Atletico Madrid. And next Tuesday, that's the 19th of September. We'll see his head to Rotterdam for match day one against the Dutch champions. We'll take a closer look at them in just a second, Miff, but in terms of what we could have got, it's a reasonably kind draw, isn't it? Yes, it's one that I think gives us a small chance of qualifying top two if we do things correctly at home. I think that's the key thing is you know, winning at home. If we manage to do that in all three games, fantastic. I would take that. You know, with when you think back to how much a fortress Parkhead was under, sorry, Parker's was under the likes of Martin O'Neill. I know we're talking about different eras, but it was it was the the, the catalyst for us. It was that home form. So if we can get back to that, if we can can be hard to play against at home, then that that gives us a real chance. I felt last year the progress that we made was just around performance and our bravery on the ball at times. We always seemed to start really well in games, which was the opposite problem that Celtics traditionally had in Europe, where you would be sitting down, maybe just sparked a can, and you're like, oh, jeez. Effie, what are you doing? <laughs> um, whereas now, we had sort of fast starts and then fizzled out. So uh, for me, it's just really, really interesting to see how Roger's going to play it. Because one thing I do know, what, what I hated, um, other than I think the, the Man City game at home, our home performances in the Champions League under Rodgers were, were fairly poor. Yeah. James Miff rightfully uh, references the time under O'Neill when it was almost a given that Celtic would just win their home games. That's your nine points, so it's like, yeah. right, we've got nine. Yeah. What can we get away from home? Mm-hmm. Isaac, did we, was it the Juventus and Rosenberg and Porto year? We got nine but failed to qualify, yeah. which is pretty unique. You'd be delighted with three home wins this time, wouldn't you? <laughs> Any Champions League campaign, but interesting that we're 
away first. I mean, if they really have that self belief, if they've really bought in and this is starting to click, fine. They've apparently got four first teamers out next week and on the injury list. It's a real opportunity to go. Imagine coming back with three points and then you've got your home games to play. So it's funny, like, I, I genuinely don't think Celtic have done the work to be confident in a really strong campaign here. But football is a funny old game. You know, that was a great performance the first half against Rangers. Mm-hmm. If they can take that kind of performance in and, you know, you guys coming in and guys coming back and stuff, you never know. I wonder if it's come too early in the rain. You know, obviously, I think things will come good under Rodgers and really promising from Ibrox. I got a comment uh, on YouTube uh, just the other day there. Uh, delusional. That's what a guy called us after. I don't think we I don't think we lost the place after Ibrox. We enjoyed the win, but we didn't think that was us going to win the Champions League. But somebody thinks, maybe it was you they were talking about, probably not me, James. You're the it was me that said it. <laughs> under your burner account. Um, but in terms of, you know, Feyenoord, Dutch champions away from home match day one, Muff, it's probably as tough a game as the six you could face. Yeah, it's, it's tough. I disagree. I think it's the easiest of the three. It's, no, I think it's tough. The pot one. tie. I know, but they're the easiest pot one. You, I, I think we'd have a much harder time at Lazio or Atletico away. I think that's the best first game to get. If you're having to play away first, that's the best one to get. Hmm. I, think, I, I just think it's tough. It's, 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 it's a contrast to a group because it's tough, but it, you can also see getting something from each game. So that's, that's the carrot for us. It just... It all hinges on our approach. All, you know, we, we we walked into the firing squad under under Rogers in previous campaigns. Well, will we will we have the control of the game or part of the game that we had under Ange last season? If we do in this group, put it this way: if we if we brought a similar level of performance as we did last year to this year, I think we'd be in a shout at qualifying. Mm. But but it's 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 different. It's different. We will approach it differently, but I just don't know how differently. <laughs> this is why I'm so intrigued to see a what the lineup is. First of all, does he go defensive? Does he bring in an Awata or somebody of that nature? And does he continue to play the you know four three three or is it four two three one or what does he go with? I think that first and foremost will tell us a lot about what to expect in general from Europe this season. So that's that's interesting in terms of final. So just some info here. Uh, they qualified for the Champions League as a pot one side by winning the Eredivisie last season, Muff. They won by seven points over PSV. And we all had a good look at them. Now, let's not kid on you didn't watch that the other week. And they were a good side. I thought PSV were a really decent side. So, Feyenoord have won it comfortably over them and then Ajax in third place. They reached the quarterfinals of last season's Europa League where they eventually lost out to Jose Mourinho's Roma. And on the way to the quarters, they beat Shakhtar 8-2 on aggregate. We had a tough time against Shakhtar. They beat them 8-2. So maybe you're kind of looking at levels there. Uh, this season, in terms of their league form, they started their campaign with two draws, but then followed them up with a 6-1 win against Almir City, who I've never heard of, and a 5-1 win against Vasilis Barkas's FC Utrecht. So they're going to be a decent side, James, whatever way you want to look at it. I mean, I'm not still not dismissing them. I'm just saying of the of the three away, I'd like, I'd like to have got that one um, rather than the other two. But yeah, I mean, if you look at Altmar a couple of years ago, who, you know, weren't champions at the, you know, the time it was they, they qualified maybe the, a different route but they were dynamite they were a really really hard team to play so fast so physical so you know I think Dutch football has probably got three four strong teams at the moment you know but the ones you mentioned there well you mentioned three plus plus, plus Alkmaar so yeah of course they're not going to be mugs um, if the injuries maybe go in our favour for the first time ever in the history of the Champions League we might sneak something if I wonder if Feyenoord will be pinning James's comments to the dressing room wall <laughs> saying this is the easiest tie we could have got match day one. Possibly as a prominent podcaster. Yeah. Um, just a couple of things to pick up. We should have beat Shakhtar easily. But didn't. Yeah, but I also, thought... was their game versus Shakhtar not post Mudrick? Might well have been. Yeah, it was, so, it was around a 16, so it'll be after I, the I, Christmas. I think, I think that, that would be a major, major factor in what we've seen for Shakhtar. Mm. It's funny he's not done it at all at Chelsea, hasn't he? Despite what Chelsea, we've seen, Chelsea's a madhouse. And yeah, was it Arsenal? He was looking at going to initially, and then he just went like, "Here's stupid money." Went all right. Mm. It's funny, like you know, people can have risked their careers for for candy, you know. Yeah, he was definitely the main man in that Shakhtar team. No if and you're right; it could have made a difference. Um, in terms of their personnel, so the manager Arnie Slot, he's one of the the highest rated managers across Europe, and he was the hot favourite to take the Spurs job before knocking it back, which led to. And stepping in, so sliding doors and all that kind of stuff. Uh, player wise, they sold Danilo to Rangers in the summer, and we could have done with him still being at Feyenoord because he is rotten. 
Um, he just looks very limited so far. They did sell one guy uh, for 25 million euro, a Turkish midfielder called Orkan Kocu, I think it is, to Benfica. And their biggest outlay was 8.5 million euros to Dynamo Zagreb for left winger Luka Ivanusic. 7.3 million is the, uh, what's the word? Euros, sterling, whatever, the conversion. Change rate. So they're, a, they're in a kind of similar ballpark to us, James, in terms of what we could afford and what they could afford. But there is absolutely no doubt they were the overwhelming favourites for this. Yeah, and, and this is where we need to see more of Celtic benchmarking themselves against teams in Europe that are at our level, you know, in terms of finance. Um, you know, those guys do go out and spend £7, £8 million in players and we don't. So we need to kind of buck up our ideas there. Yeah, they'll be favourites, but in terms of their wage bill, our wage bill, which, you know, is, is, a, is a marker, they're very similar. I think they might actually be just slightly underneath us. I think we pay slightly better, but then there's a big old squad at Celtic at the moment. So that might be that might be part of that, but yeah, we we'll just need to see you on the right. And on that, Miff, can we go there and get a positive result on my stay one? Yes, yes, we can. Um, you've got you've got to believe that. You know, we're, we're here. We don't just want to be in that mindset where we're just taking part. I think every game, every team in the group will be looking at every game as one where they can possibly get a positive result. I think it's that type of group. So. We just have to approach it in that manner, be positive and, and, and hopefully, hopefully, fingers crossed, we can go off to a really good start. And on that note, James, it's, you know, we've been in groups, we've been in some groups of death, mm. you know, PSGs and Man Cities and, and Real Madrids and, and some real, real tough outfits. And there's games you've got to just known you've got no chance. Real Madrid at the Bernabeu, you, you just don't have a, a hope there. This, Miff's made the point, all three of these opponents, you would fancy on your day pulling off a result, either at home or away, and uh, but they'll, they'll all be feeling the same one. All four teams will feel we've got a chance of at least Europa here, if, if not something better. And on that note, I'm going to ask you is where do you think we'll finish points wise in the group? So we've talked about, you know, could we get the home ones and see what we get away from home? I've got a figure in my head, but what do you think we'll get in terms of points out of the what's that 18 points? Seven, and I, seven. What's we'll, your rationale? A couple of home ones, or we'll get at least a draw next week. I think we'll take points there. Um, we'll say we'll we get a draw bring that back we'll win two at home and then hey, Madrid will pump us <laughs> so a couple of home wins the draw next week and then a few defeats and seven points would certainly give you yeah, an Europa. outside chance uh, of proper qualification but certainly Europa would Should be in the mix Europa, yeah, yeah. Yeah. what do you think Muff? 18? no yeah, I, I was actually going to go for seven um, still do that. Same, right. same sort of rationale I think we we'll won a couple of games at home I hope we win a couple of games at home then where the other point comes for that could be anywhere. <laughs> anywhere. <laughs> but I think that would be a, a decent return. I think is where we're at. Aye. You know? Keep in mind we get two points last season. Despite all the promise and stuff and all the good performance, we get two points. It and ultimately would, it's about yeah. getting and, points. And in that's the it. That's it. You're right. That that's that's what it's about. What approach will we take to these games? To maximise our chances of qualifying, and and yeah. nobody really knows because we're we're thinking based on what we've all said tonight. We're thinking that we'll change tweaks slightly, but you never know. We might not. I think the Rogers just isn't going to play that you know, enjoyable as it is cavalier football that uh, Postecoglou brings to the table. Um, I, I think he's you know last time out with Rogers in Europe, you know, terrifying. I think your your point's the, the main one is personnel there's real talent in the squad now needs a wee bit more should have had a bit more in the summer but there's real talent there to be able to do something and just set this as the building blocks for next year and also we don't know we could have a couple of gems and guys like Tillo and Bernardo these guys could really come in and, and spark things into life uh, how many points do I think James? thanks for asking I think uh, <laughs> beat me to it I think I'm going to go for 8 points I think we can get a couple of wins and a couple of draws and potentially sneak through on 8 points so we'll see how it goes but that's a huge challenge really exciting you know, games to look forward to as always we'll cover these games pre and post match on the Celtic Exchange Plus remember to visit theceltichexchange.com slash plus uh, just some final updates before we wrap up this week's show. So you may have heard from the Anthony Joseph episode that Celtic are in talks with Matt O'Reilly to extend his deal. So we should probably mention that at the time when we went uh, waxing lyrical about him. But that's exciting stuff and that would be great news. Leah Labada has frustratingly picked up a thigh injury on international duty. So he might be out for around about a month. And as mentioned, Miff, we've covered it. But Gary Hooper linked with a, a, <laughs> a sensational return to Celtic after scoring a couple of goals at the fives. But any comments, Miff, on those final updates? Frustrating for Abada. Um, he, was, he was he was looking sharp, but yeah, 
um, Yang has looked equally as impressive this season again I'll repeat what I said last week once you've beat your man for the fifth time just get your head up and at home play a pass aye um, and yeah welcome home Gary Hooper <laughs> <laughs> James your final comments for this week's show uh, just I, uh, you know international break was nice timing um, just to kind of turn up the gas on the, the gloat cooker um, but that's that, that's all done and dusted now back to proper football come, come the weekend and then Champions League next week as well it's, it's all coming around nice yeah it's all good stuff my final word of the week goes to yourself well, it's uh, as I say, I, I hopefully I've, I've sounded a wee bit more invigorated. I, I was very conscious that I was quite crab it last week. Um, How's your shoulder, by the way? Better. Better. Thanks for asking, Tino. You're Appreciate welcome. that. Mrs. Miff uh, has had off the, the sympathies over. It's gone. Uh, I had two or three days, so it was pretty decent. Um, but yeah, all in all, happy. Ha- the results made a huge difference. And I think, like James mentioned earlier, now it's about momentum. It's going on that one of those runs for a six or seven game block where you win, you keep that up, and we get to see some of the newer faces in the squad really contribute to that. And we know that Rodgers is capable of that. What was the run? Was it 70-odd games before Hearts yeah. brought it to an end? So hopefully we can see something along those lines. So that wraps things up on this latest episode of the Celtic Exchange Weekly. Thanks to James and Muff for joining me today. And as always, our thanks to you for tuning in. We'll be back with the Celtic Exchange Weekly this time next week. Or if you want to hear even more from us, you can enjoy more podcasts, more reaction and more Celtic every week at the Celtic Exchange Plus. Or this weekend, we'll bring you our countdown to kick off and final whistle shows for the Dundee game. Visit the CelticExchange.com slash plus right now to get involved. But in the meantime, thanks for listening and we'll see you again very soon.